chapter 5, and then we're going to go back to uh, 1 Samuel 17. First, First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 gives us our context for what we're going to be looking at today. Let me back up a couple of verses here because sometimes we do some of the word but not all of the word. Have you, have you ever been guilty of that? You do some of the word but not all of the word? And, and sometimes it's purposeful for whatever reason, you know. And then sometimes it's just because you've kind of neglected what's, what's surrounding that. So, 1 Peter, let's go back to verse 6. It says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And usually the way we use that verse of scripture is to say, you know, you need to submit yourself to the way and the will of the Lord and whatever he's doing, wherever you're at. And, and just, you know, doesn't matter what you think, you just submit yourself to what he's doing. Amen? But, but this is leading up to something. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And then we take that one kind of out of context. It's not completely, but it can, we take it kind of out of context and say, see, if we just throw everything upon him, then we don't need to worry. And that is true. Okay? But, he's, but, the, but Peter is leading up to something. Then the next verse it says, Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking who he may devour. Now let's start, start at the beginning and go back down. Without the pauses for you know, interjection there. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. So, so we submit ourselves to the Lord. We, we submit ourselves to the Lord. We cast our care upon him, and then... We are also in the process of doing these things, submitting and casting. We are also watching. Be, be sober, be vigilant. Have you ever noticed that when you're drunk, you don't see too much? Right? The wrong kind of drunk? There's the right kind and the wrong kind? Amen. You can be drunk in the spirit. That's okay. But when you're drunk, you don't see too much, and, and, and you're, not, you're not vigilant. You don't even know what's going on around you hardly. <laughs> you know, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. doesn't say seeking who he's going to eat next. It says seeking who he may so that means he must have permission to eat you. Don't say okay. Don't say okay. Yeah, you can have, here, here's lunch. Go ahead. Don't say that. So, let's go back to uh, 1 Samuel 17. So he's going around seeking who he may devour. And you need to, ta you need to tell him you may not. Amen. Amen. So, you need to understand this about the enemy. He doesn't know if he can. He doesn't know if you will let him. But he will try. You can be sure of that. He doesn't know if, if he can. He don't know if, he will let, if you'll let him. But he will try. He will try to devour you. To, to devour you. So, the primary weapon of the enemy is fear. The primary, you know, when, when somebody big and bad says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat you, that's a scary place to be in, right? I, think of it, here, here's a good illustration. When, right after the movie Jaws came out, the next summer, the following summer, so this stuff is still fresh in my mind. It came out in the summer of 1975. And then in the summer of 1976, I'm out in the ocean. Bolsa Chica. 
Bolsa Chica is a favorite surfing place, and I was learning how to surf. And my, you know, so I'm out there with a friend of mine, and and I asked him before we got in the water. Of course, you know, being somebody from the desert and all that, I'm not familiar with the ocean. I said, "Are there any sharks around here?" And he goes. Yeah, sometimes, but they don't really bother anybody. I'm like, Ooh, ah, okay. <laughs> and so I get out there in the water, and, and we get, you know, you have to get past the breakers. That's the hard work. You get out there, swim past, you know, the waves beat you up, especially if you don't know what you're doing. And then you get out past, and you're sitting there, and you're waiting for that big hump to come along so you can get on that wave that's going to farm. And so we're sitting out there just kind of, you know, and we were, uh, we didn't use those big old long boards. You know, they, back in the 70s, they, they shrank down to about this long. And so they don't really hold you out of the water real good. They kind of do, but you've got to move your hands and feet around a little bit. And, you know, that's like a, that's like a lure to a, <laughs> to a shark. <laughs> Ooh, feet, you know. And I, I'm, so I'm out there doing that stuff, and I'm talking to my buddy, and, and just for no reason at all, all of a sudden I hear that. Dun, 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 dun. I'm like, oh, my God. And I started looking. <laughs> I'm not waiting for the next wave. <laughs> but fear. So his primary weapon is fear. And so the story of David and Goliath is how to defeat fear and the source of it. How to defeat it and the source of it. So uh, let's pray and we'll get into this. Father God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, we thank you that you're going to help us today. You're going to show us how to overwhelm the enemy when he comes at us. Lord, we know that we can stand on your word. And we know that we can stand in faith. Now, Lord, show us how to defeat fear as we look into your word today. And you help us in Jesus' name. And all who agree, say amen. amen. So it says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. And they were gathered together at Sholach. <laughs> I love these old Bible words. Which belongeth to Judah and pitched between Sholach and Ezekiah in Ephesadam in that's what it says. <laughs> okay. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. So they, they come out there and they're, ready, they're getting ready to fight. And so what they would typically, typically do is one army would camp on one hill. And, and this is back in the days of, you know, swords and spears and bows and arrows and things like that. And the other army would camp on the other hill and then they'd make their battle plans and then they'd send their armies down to clash. Okay. And so it says, And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley in between them. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. That's the valley of Elah. Deciding whether they're going to choose faith or fear. Do you know that if someone doesn't give their life to the Lord, they are choosing fear? They don't think so. They think we're being scaredy cats. You know, you need a God to lean on or something like that. Have you ever heard something like that? No, no. We're choosing faith. Amen. So there's a valley between them, and it says, There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines whose name was Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits in a span that's nine feet nine so his head would be right about where that pillar is there that separates the room <laughs> yeehaw and he had a helmet of brass on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and, and the weight of the coat was about 5,000 shekels of brass meaning it weighed about 125 pounds that's a lot of armor. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his beam was a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, which is about 15 pounds. And one bearing a shield went before him. Well, after carrying all that stuff, somebody's got to carry the shield. <laughs> somebody's got to carry the shield. And he stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? Number one, he is not a Philistine. 
He's a son of Anak. That's not a Philistine. But he's siding with them. But he's not a Philistine. So you need to understand, the enemy, when he comes at you to scare you, he's lying right out of the gate. Okay? Am I not a Philistine and you servants... And you are servants to Saul. Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. So you're up there on a hill and this monster of a man comes down in the middle and shouts. The enemy will always try to define the rules of engagement to you. This is the way it's going to be. We don't have to follow his rules. Saul's up there and he's got an army to kill one. I don't care how big the guy is. You get a few archers on the hill, he's dead. He's an easy target. He's almost 10 foot tall. He's easy to hit. Right? Just call a few archers up and go. Next time he comes out there and starts yelling at us, just shoot him. Y'all, have you ever seen uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Indiana Jones? Remember, he's chasing after his girlfriend, and he, gets, he comes out, and all of a sudden, the crowd splits in front of him. And they're in this city in, in uh, Egypt, I think. Anyway, they're, uh, and they're, they're running through a crowd, and all of a sudden, the crowd splits, and there's this guy standing in front of him, and he pulls out some swords, and he's whoa, whoa, like this, you know? That's the enemy, threatening like that. And Indiana Jones goes, bang. <laughs> They'll have to get in a sword fight with you. See, and this is what the enemy does. He comes out and he makes a bunch of noise and he shows you how bad he is and everything. Just shoot him. <laughs> the reason why they filmed that scene that day was because Harrison Ford was so sick with dysentery. They didn't, you know, he was, Mary was all sweaty and everything in that scene. I don't know if you remember. He was all sweaty. It wasn't because he had been running. It was because he was so sick. And he was supposed to do a sword fight with the guy. But when he saw that and he was so sick, he, hadn't, he didn't want any part of that, even though they're faking it. So he just pulled out the gun and pulled the trigger. And the director went, that's good. <laughs> Woo! We don't have to play by your rules, devil. So don't follow the enemy's plan. Don't follow him. You know, he says, you have to come out and fight me. No, we're just going to kill you. Amen. Verse 9. If he, is, if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Number two, he seeks to enslave and has no intention of keeping his word. So he said, this is the deal. You come out and kill me, then we will serve you. This is the thing that we ought to remember about this. A snake is always a snake. You all know the story about the, the, the snake and the man crossing the river, and the snake wants to get across the river, and the man comes along, and the snake says, well, will you help me get across the river? And the man says, no, you're a snake. I'm not picking you up. He goes, please, I just need help to get across the river. And he talks to him a little bit, which is what the enemy does to you. He just keeps blah, 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 blah. And then you think, well, it's not that bad. Yes, it is. You're talking to a snake. <laughs> Something wrong with you if you do that. Right? If you're talking to a spiritual thing, there's snake, there's something wrong with you too. Mm hmm? Hey? You know, remember the devil came to Jesus, gave him three temptations, and Jesus defeated him with three short scriptures. It is written, it is written, it is written. Okay? So, the, you, know, the, you know the story. The man picks up the snake. He gets across the river. He starts to put the snake down. The snake bites him. He said, why did you do that? The snake goes, I'm a snake. <laughs> well, okay. The enemy's the enemy. He's not going to change. All right? Third thing. He represents himself as someone who cannot be defeated. Verse 10, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel. That's ridiculous. 
Remember, I mean, I just, you know, like I just said, you put a few archers on the hill, he's dead. How can this one guy defy the army? Aren't, isn't the army of the Lord arrayed behind each and every one of us? You all remember the example, you know, of Elisha and his servant? The servant gets up in the morning, and he looks up, and he sees the army of Syria, and he's, oh, my God. And he goes and gets the servant of God, and he, oh, master, master, we're surrounded. And he comes out, and he goes, oh. And the servant's like, what? He goes, Lord, open his eyes. And then they, and the servant's eyes were open, and they saw the angel armies behind the Syrians. They're always arrayed for us. What the enemy tries to do is single you out. Send one guy down here. Well, you know, he's almost 10 foot tall. This ain't no challenge for him. He thinks. Okay. But what the enemy tries to do to each and every one of us is take you and put you different. That's a lie. All temptations are common. So what they do, you know, let's, let's put this over an area of disease because we're kind of talking about that anyway, right? So, so this is the doc, you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, what you have is rare. Pride puffs up. Oh. That's not pride. Yes, it is. Can God defeat any disease? What's that got to do with you? Nothing. Well, I have it. No, you don't. <laughs> don't swallow that. The enemy tries to single you out, and then if he can single you out, you're dead. He's going to get you. Because you cannot naturally fight a 10 foot man. Okay? So he says, do this. Send, send somebody out here. I defy the armies of Israel. That not only just, he said, but give me a man that we may fight together. He's, so he said this, I'm not scared of the army, but send someone down here. He's lying. He is scared of the army. He don't want to fight the army. He wants to fight one guy. So when he comes to you and he says, I'm going to fight you, you say, I have an army. And he'll try to convince you that you're by yourself. That's a lie. You're not by yourself. He represents himself as someone who cannot be defeated, but we all know this. 2,000 years ago, he was defeated. Yes. Do you all know that? 2,000 years, say, 2,000 years, years ago, he was defeated. He was. So when he tries to represent himself as being undefeated, you go, no, no, I remember what happened. Mm -hmm. Amen. Next thing, he will repeat his doctrine until we believe it. Doctrine? Yeah, propaganda, same thing. Okay? So, give me a man that we may fight. So when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Remember what I said? What's the main tactic of the enemy? Fear. They heard the words. It's just words. He cannot carry out the threat. If he charges the army by himself, within a matter of a few seconds, he's going to be dead. Okay? So fear. When they heard this, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The reason why we do not react in the way that we're supposed to is we're believing the words of the enemy, not the words of the Lord. So it says, Now David was a son of, the, of, of that Ephraphite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the, and the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went into battle were Eliab, the firstborn. Next to him were Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from 
Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And so he went out with them. Okay. And then he went back to, you know, take care of the sheep. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. That's 39 too many. Don't listen to the devil day by day by day by day by day. He will defeat you. So they're sitting there up on the hill and they're watching him come down and yell at him every day. And Jesse said to David, you know, whenever something's going on, God's always got somebody he's stirring up. May not be you, but he'll help you. Okay? God's always got someone he's stirring up. Might be a little shepherd boy back at, you know, 30 miles away. Don't even know what's going on out here. But he knows how to believe God. So now Jesse said to unto David his son, Now take to thy brother and Ephah the parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp of thy brethren. So, <laughs> the devil comes out every day. He came out, at, you know, Goliath is a representation of the devil. Strong man. Remember Jesus talked about a strong man? Come out every day. He come out every day and threaten them. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Are they resisting him? No. They're standing on the hill. We're going to stand up here where it's safe. He can climb the hill. Right? <laughs> so, when we believe the word of God, we defeat the devil. Let's keep reading here. Verse 18. He says, And carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of the thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they were all the men of Israel, and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines, which, well, they weren't really fighting, they're standing there watching. <laughs> but, they, you know, they were going to fight, is what they were thinking. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded with him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the, to the fight and and shouted for the battle, for Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. All they're doing is yelling at each other, though. Yeah. Kind of like a schoolyard fight. Remember when you were in school? You know, they, yeah, 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 back and forth at each other. And then they'd hit each other once and roll on the ground. <laughs> yeah. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. Now, David never heard this guy before. They all had been hearing him. This is the army of God. Led by the chosen one of God, Saul. Now, I know Saul wasn't always right, and he wasn't always right in the head, but he's still chosen. The Bible says that Saul was a big man. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. So that means he was probably six and a half foot tall, somewhere around there. He's a big, tough guy. And he's got a well-trained army. They ain't got no reason to be scared of one guy. But they listened to the words. How you listen to the words will determine what's going to happen to you. Now listen to this. This is very important stuff today. How you listen to the words. If, if the words start coming out and you say this, it's a lie. I know it's a lie. I'm not swallowing this. You'll probably win. Why would you say probably? You've got to cut it off. Don't wait. Cut it off. Okay, this is what we're going to learn. So, if we believe the threat, listen to this, if we believe the threat, you know, the Philistine, send out a man, I'm done, you know, just like he had done for 40 days already, send out a man. If we believe the threat, we are already enslaved. And don't know it. Whatever information you've got in your mind, 
that counters the word of God is keeping you from being victorious the way that God wants you to be. Whatever information that you think is Bible truth and it is not, we hear stuff, right? Growing up and going to churches and all that, and you hear things and it's not Bible truth. The Bible says that Jesus is the victor and the devil has been defeated. Anything besides that, when something faces you, is not the truth. Well, I just have to go through this thing. There's nothing in there that says that. Amen. Now, we may go through something because we have to correct our thinking, but is that the truth? No. It's just what we think. Okay? And truth to you is not truth. Truth is truth. Did you hear me? Truth to you is not truth. Truth is truth. We believe all kinds of stuff. You know, especially like I can remember some of the stuff I believed when I first started going to church. I'm like, good Lord, what was I thinking? And I've been, I've been getting corrections ever since. Concerning my thinking, you know, me and the Lord. I've been good, you know. The, the day you think you know it, you're going to get defeated. You always want to be learning. So if we believe the threat, we're already enslaved. But be the one that believes. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. And I'm not talking about being foolish, but be the one that believes. If you're the one that believes, you're going to help people. Amen? Amen? Next verse. So, and David heard them. And when all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled for him and were so afraid. So you think, you know, this little shepherd boy, he comes out there. Now, he's not just an ordinary person. I understand that. But he is still a little, he's not a big guy. And nobody's big compared to Goliath anyway. And he comes out, and this one big old guy comes out and shouts like he's been for 40 days. And so we're getting glimpses of things. Every day for 40 days, he'd come out like that and they'd run. This isn't the first day they ran. They ran every day. <laughs> what are they doing? They're looking for a champion. Who's the champion supposed to be? Saul. Saul's back here hiding in his tent. Well, I'm the king. I can't go out there and be an example for everybody. Ouch. Yeah. I, I have a friend of mine that calls me every so often. I won't tell you who he is. but uh, That calls me every so often. And he says something to me. And I'm trying to get, it, get something across to him. He hasn't learned it yet. But I'll keep saying it. He, he, he says, you know... The last time I talked to him, he said, well, you just walk in radical faith. I said, no, I just walk in faith. Faith is always radical to those that don't believe. Now, there's a whole army running from one guy. And one little boy is going... Who is this guy? Right? Yes. Be the one that believes. Say, I'm the one. I'm the one. So, <laughs> where am I at? Get down to the right verse here. So they fled from him and were so afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up surely to defy Israel? Is he come up and it shall be that the man who killeth him the king will enrich with, a great, with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. That means you don't have to pay taxes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Verse 26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done? He already don't like this guy He's down there yelling at everybody and scaring the army that's supposed to be killing him. What? And wait a minute. Not only do, if I just act in faith, uh, you know, I'm going to defeat the enemy, but what, ha what happens if I do? Okay? He said, <laughs> What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? The shame. 
For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. And the people answered him after this manner saying, It shall be done to the man that kills him. Go for it, boy. <laughs> if you act in faith, God has a reward for you. If you don't act in faith, you're going to be enslaved. Let's choose the reward. Be the one that believes. Seek the reward. So now, what happens when you decide to be in faith? This is what people think. Well, when I, when I join into faith, when I join in with God, then, you know, people are going to join in with me. No, they're not. They're going to look at you like you got a screw loose. They're going to say, you're going to do what? And they're going to try to give you reasons why not. Who do you think you are? You need to always remember this. If you know God and you know what he'll do. And you are convinced. Because faith does not work without being convinced first. If you are convinced that God is able to make you overcome the enemy in front of you. It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. Well, brother, you're just going off the deep end. Come on, let's jump. <laughs> well, no, you know, the deep end is deep. <laughs> I can swim. Can't you swim? Yeah, but it's deep there. You know, I can remember we used to go out to out on Lake Mojave. Lake Mojave down at the deep end is like 175 feet deep or something like that. Down close to the dam. And, you know, we're swimming over here and swimming over here and swimming over here. And it's over your head. The water I'm talking about, you know, it's 10 feet deep or whatever underneath you. And then you get down close to the dam and you're like, I don't know if I want to jump out of the boat. <laughs> well, it's 175 feet to the bottom. No matter, you can swim. I've seen, I've seen grown men and women. Well, I'm going to put a life jacket on. The boat's right there. <laughs> you didn't put a life jacket on when you were 50 feet from shore. You're five feet from the boat. Which is safer? I know our minds don't always collect these things as we're going along. Through, you know, but you understand. Okay? Fear... Is what the enemy uses to try to get us to back up. But God and one is a majority. God and one is a majority. Next verse says, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. You little punk. Who do you think you are? Modern vernacular. Okay, but that's what he's, that's what he's doing. He's killing against him, and he said, Why comest thou down here? What did you come down here for? And with whom has those left those few sheep in the wilderness? Few sheep. Don't know if, you know, maybe he didn't know about David killing the bear and the lion. Don't know. We ain't worried about the sheep. We're worried about the wolf. Sheep ain't going to attack you. <laughs> I know thy pride. Do you hear that? When you step out in faith, people accuse you, will accuse you. People in your own camp, your own house, your own church will say, you're being prideful. Understand something. If someone knows how to be in faith and you don't, there ain't no time to attack them. Smile. So I, mean, I saw a few heads go, like, no, no, that's not what I was trying to do. I'm trying to get you to lean in, not pull back. <laughs> okay? When someone knows how to be in faith and you don't, Tell them to have at it. 
I don't get it, but apparently you do. Go ahead. Amen. Because that giant ain't going to move because you're scared. Okay? So if somebody decides they want to be the champion, say, yeah, go ahead. I'll be back here praying. <laughs> That's all right. That's where you ought to be. Yes. You don't want to go down there. If you're acting that way, he, that giant will get you. So, the, so, get behind the champion. That's okay as far as that goes. But learn how to be like that. So the own, those in the own camp will try to discourage you. Remember, we always believe the word of the Lord. Just because, you know, your brother, your sister in Christ, whatever, they don't get it, they don't understand it, whatever, and they say, uh, whatever, to you, you know, some, some kind of discouraging thing. Remember the word of the Lord. What did God tell you? What did God tell you? This is what we do, though. We get in these mental gyrations. Well, how come they don't understand? They don't need to understand. You do. Well, why are they saying this stuff to me? Because they don't understand. <laughs> don't sit there and... You know, don't sit there and go with it. So David says, next verse, and David said, now what have I done? <laughs> His brother tells you, you little punk, what do you think you're doing? Get back over there with the sheep. And David goes, no, what did I do? Is there not a cause? He said, I'm not trying to get you to go fight him. I'm going to do it. Hmm. Verse 30, and he turned from him to another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. Meaning, he turned to, you know, his brother told him, you little punky, get back over there with the sheep. What do you think you're doing? And David goes, I didn't do anything to you. And he turns and he says, now what happens if I go kill him? Give yourself a reason to win. Yes. Give yourself a reason to win. Well, I, you know, I get that pretty girl and I don't have to pay taxes and he's going to dump all kinds of money on me. Sounds good. Let's go. Uh-huh. You all know that the daughter wasn't really a blessing. Keep reading in the Bible. <laughs> Buddy thought she was, you know. She is pretty, I guess, or something. I don't know. <laughs> so remember the prize. Let's keep going. And when, and when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent them to him. They said, there's some kid down in the camp that says he can beat that guy up. What kid? I don't know, some kid. You know, his brothers are here. They've been here with the army, and he's down there saying, you know, I can take this guy. What happens if I take him? And we told him what would happen if we, you know, if he goes down there and defeats him. He says, okay, I'll do it. So they went and told Saul, you know, told the guy that's supposed to be fighting the giant. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> and, they, and he sent for him. <laughs> and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Shouldn't Saul be saying this? Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. Your courage, it takes courage to be in faith. You understand that, right? You got to be brave to be in faith. Ooh. How does this relate to the cross? Remember, Jesus said, the Bible says that Jesus endured the shame looking to the prize. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 So he died, yeah, but he was resurrected. Amen. And he lives forevermore. He didn't get defeated. As a matter of fact, it was in that three days that he went down and beat the devil's butt. Sorry for the language. <laughs> That's what happened, though. Amen? So, you, so when you are in faith, your, 
your faith will speak out of your heart. And, and you need to understand this. When your faith is talking, not everybody's going to understand you and they're not going to agree with you and they're not going to want to go along with you, but they need to hear your words of faith because your words of faith will encourage them eventually. Okay? Eventually. So, uh, I, I'm not bragging, but I, I want you to understand something about me, okay? And, you, and most of you have heard this thing before. God sends me into areas where nobody wants to go. Why? Because I'm, I'm not afraid of the giant down there in the valley. I'm not. When I first came here, Brother Ricky, was, he was planning on being here this morning, Brother Ricky come to me, you know, after we'd gotten the church going for a little bit, he goes, he goes, hey, Pastor, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. He goes, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a demon, there's a demon sitting up there on Kirkland Peak. I said, yeah, I know. If you're walking where you're supposed to be, you know what's going on around you. Be sober, be vigilant, for your enemy seeks who he may devour. If you're walking around and you don't know what's going on around you, you're doing the wrong thing. Wake up. Okay? He said, do you know? Well, yeah, I know. Do you know about that? I said, yeah. He goes, man, he really hates you. I said, good. You don't want him to like me, do you? <laughs> that wouldn't be a good thing. If he said, I really like that guy, he'd be like, whoo, need to go to another church then. <laughs> okay. All right. So your courage will encourage others. <laughs> so, so it says, verse 33, and Saul, and Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go out against this Philistine to fight with him. See what people say to you. You can't do it. But thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, I have experience. <laughs> right? I have experience. Thy servant kept his father's sheep. Now notice how David was talking to Saul. He didn't say, listen, buddy. I know what I'm doing. He didn't do that. He said, thy servant. Okay. Thy, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came out a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out from the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth, and when he arose up against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Barehanded. Now you can't do that without God's help. I don't care how big a man you are. Okay. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing, as, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. This sounds like somebody you want to get behind. Yes. Amen? Verse 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord hath, that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Whenever you step out in faith, Whenever you step out in faith, when people finally relent, they're going to say, go get them. You're going to do that anyway. Isn't that right? The only reason why he's over there talking to Saul, Saul wanted to talk to him. He's going to go kill him anyway. You all understand this? Okay? This is shouting ground right here. The same God that delivered me out of the last two is going to deliver me into the, deliver me out of this one also. Yes. Whatever, you know, you all have got experiences of God coming through for you, don't yes. you? Yes. And whatever whatever your experience that you have that God delivered you out of the hand of the lion and the bear will also deliver you out of this giant. <laughs> I'm doing good preaching today. Don't expect others to join with you. Just know that God's with you. Amen. God in one is always a majority. Then, you know, so he goes, go, but, okay, let me help you out here, boy. 
Well, I got God. I don't need no help. And Saul armed, <laughs> and Saul armed David with his armor. Now remember, Saul's like six six. David's. This ain't gonna fit real well. He armed him with his armor and put on a helmet of brass on his head and armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword about his waist. And as he had said to go, for he had not proved it or never used this stuff before. David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David, them, David put them off. Of him. So he didn't say, he didn't, he didn't get into an argument with him. He said, I, I can't use it, I don't know how. Thank you, but this ain't going to work. Okay? <laughs> Verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook because Goliath has four brothers. This kid figures he's a dead shot, right? He don't have no extra ammunition. One for each of them. Now, I don't know if you know anything about slingshots. This ain't the kind with the V and the rubber band. This is the ones that they used to do like this. And that's hard. It's hard to hit things dead on with that thing. This one works better. But he only took five rocks. He took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. What's the lesson in this deal? Don't use other stuff. Well, Brother Hagin did blah, 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 whatever. Or I've seen Pastor Greg do it. That don't mean you can do it. I'm not saying you can't, but you can't do it because I did. Use what God has given you. What does that mean, use what God has given you? Remember, it's always, it's always the word of the Lord. Find scripture to cover your case. There's got, there's got to be something in this big old thick book that will cover what you're going through. And the reason why I defeated the enemy is because I used something out of here. Did God lead David to fight the giant? Nope. He just went. And when he got there and saw what was going on, he said, huh? we don't have to put up with this mess. <laughs> well, it's all over then, right? No. Nope. And the Philistine came and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him, and the Philistine looked about and saw David and disdained him, like, Ugh, what is this? It's an insult, you know? Little kid. What? I'm asking for a champion, you give me a kid? He disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? Did she come out here with staves? You know, because he had that walking pole. <laughs> you know, the shepherd's pole. <laughs> Don't want to beat me with a stick. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Demigods are devils. Okay. Curse David by his gods, and the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, See, the enemy is going to threaten you personally. Yeah, I don't care about that army. I'm looking at you now. This, that's when you don't want to fear. The army's on the hill behind you. They're too far away. You're in front of the giant. Okay? Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. There's people all the time looking for my, where's my weapon? Right here. Did you see me? Yes. Where's my weapon? Right here. You're going to lose. Jesus already defeated you. You're not going to win this battle either. 
Jesus died for me and then he rose again three days later and in that time he went down there and, and he took away the keys of death and hell and of the grave from you. You've been defeated. You're still defeated. You'll always be defeated and you're not going to get me either. Amen. This is your weapon. Yes. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee and I will give the carcass the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto not only am I going to kill you, we're going to wipe you all out. And the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth and all that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Kirkland. Yes. Until you make the word of God personal, it's just a book. Yes. I'm not trying to demean the Bible. I'm just saying until you make it personal, it's just a book to you. Amen. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saved not with sword and spear, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. When the enemy threatens you, you tell him what's going to happen. You know, the enemy generally he comes, you know, we know about, know about this one. He comes to you and he tells you about your past. Tell him about his future. You know, you did this, that, and other thing. You messed this up. You did that. You insulted somebody. You did something wrong. You, you know, in our past life, God knows what we've done in our past lives, right? We don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> it's not past like we never lived it, but, right? But we really don't want to talk about all that mess. And he tries to bring it up and say, look, I've been redeemed from all that. You're going to hell. Actually, he's going to the lake of fire. He's not really going to hell. He ain't never been to hell. He ain't going to hell. Y'all know that, right? That one ain't never been to hell. He ain't going there. But he is going to land in fire. You know, frying pan to the fire. <laughs> Y'all having fun yet? Yeah. See, when you do this, you win. Yes. Say, I win. I win. Oh, thank you, God. Next verse. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. When the enemy starts yelling you, he's wanting you to back up. You need to move forward. Thank you, brother. You need to move forward. What's going to happen next? Move forward. You'll see. You back up. You know what's going to happen. He's going to start having lunch. Amen. He moved forward to meet with the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and thence and took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sank into his forehead. Now you know a guy that's that big has got a thick skull. Right? You know, it's probably like trying to kill a kill a steer with a stone. You can do it, but you got to sling it real hard. Okay? Sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. When you run to the battle, the reason why you do that is because you already know you're going to win. If you stand there and wait to see what's going to happen, you're going to be lunch. Run to the battle. Well, I don't know, Pastor. Each step you take forward will give you courage. Each step you take forward will give you courage. By the time David took 10 or 15 steps towards that giant, he was popping with faith, and all he could do was hit him in the head. He couldn't miss. And then what do you do? Make sure the threat's dead. It says, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. So you hit him in, when you hit somebody in the head with a rock, are they dead? Maybe. 
Now the Bible says he's dead, but David don't know that for sure. Right? He might have just knocked him out. Verse 51, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took out his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut his head off therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Make sure the threat is dead. Throw the rock and then go get the sword and cut his head off. And the enemy will run screaming. You know, that scripture where, you know, James 4, 7 that we looked at earlier, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The Amplified says he will run for you as though in terror. They're like, oh no. David killed him and then cut off his head. Make sure the threat is dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they fled and the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines they're supposed to have done this 40 days ago thank God the champion showed up you know it's the champion he's just a boy he's just a human being that believes God So they chased him, they chased him to the gates of Ekron and wounded the Philistines and fell down the way to Sherechim and even to Gath and Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing up to the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. So David killed, off, killed him, cut off his head, and then they plundered the camp. Take back what is yours. Some, listen, you know, there's, some of you are thinking, well, that's, you know, we'll just have to let it go. That's, that's behind me. There ain't nothing in the Bible says to do that. The only place the Bible says to leave things behind is in the area of forgiveness. Is that right? Yes. You know, somebody does something wrong, you forgive them, okay, that's buried in the past. Okay? When you came to the cross and Jesus saved you, your past was buried in the past. Right? That's forgiveness. That's forgiveness. What about your stuff that the devil been taking from you all these years? Get it back. You defeated him, get it back. Amen? And... You know, you remember what's going to happen to David? He's going to get the girl, the gold, and no taxes. <laughs> Woohoo! Right? So let's end it with this. Verse 54. They spoiled the tents, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Keep a reminder of your victory. When the enemy returns, because he will, you know, he ain't got no sense. When the enemy returns, you have proof of your victory. God did it before. God will do it again. You know, the, the father of faith in the Bible is Abraham. And it says that when they got to the place that they, that they realized that the promise of the Lord was going to come to pass, that they sat down, I'm paraphrasing, they sat down and they reminisced about all the things that God had brought them through and received strength. That thing that had attacked you for years and stole from you is dead. Don't let it return. Don't let it return. And as you rise up in that, God will use your hands to lay hands on others and the gift of healing concerning that which afflicted you will deliver others.
You all understand what I'm talking about? The Bible says, you know, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, it describes all the gifts of the Spirit, you know, the manifestations of the Spirit. One of the things it talks about is gifts of healings. Gifts of healing, not the gift of healing. If you, if that were true, you could just heal anybody. You can't. Jesus could. You're not him. Amen. He said you'll go. That he he told the church, "You shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover." He didn't say you can cure everybody. That's why we need everybody. That's why we need the body because the gifts, the gifts are divided severally as he wills. And whatever's going to work in one won't show up in the other. Why not? Who cares? Do your part. Amen? Sometimes we get, we get caught up in the why nots instead of the what fors. <laughs> the why nots never work anyway. Forget it. Let's do the what for. He said, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's what for. Why shall you lay hands on the sick? So they shall recover. Yeah. What for? Well, I tried that. It didn't work. That's a why not. Next. Next. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a, there was a, a minister that was known for, known for getting people... He owed so much so that the whole, he had this large church auditorium back around the turn of the last century, you know, 1900. And the walls of his church inside was decorated with wheelchairs and walkers and canes and stuff like that. And it spelled out different things that God would do in the area of healing. Real well known. And he put a post in the paper one time in San Francisco Chronicle and he, he said that he was in a certain motel and in a certain room and if you come by between the hours of, you know, 8 and 5 or whatever it was and come to this motel that he will lay hands on you and you shall recover. Sounds good. So the day of the day that the, that uh, he was going to do this thing, they got up you know, they got out there in the morning and they opened up the door to the motel and there's a line a mile long, literally. You know, 1900, doctors couldn't fix much, right? And a lot of what they did didn't work. Okay. So these people are lined up for a mile. And, and so they and say, okay. They come to the door and they take their name and so forth. Get their information from them and say, okay, go up, go up to this room. Knock on the door. When he tells you to come in, walk in. That was the instructions. Okay. So all day long, people are walking up there. Knock, knock, knock. Come in. He asked every, every single person in that all that mile long, and then probably more people joined it as the day went on, right? And every, every person that walked through the door, he asked them one question. Do you believe I can do this? Now this is astounding. You'd think the percentage would be better than this, but all day long, one person said, yes. Everybody else gave him an excuse. Why not? Instead of what for? That one person that said yes, he got up from behind the desk, he walked over to them, laid hands on them, they were instantly healed. David's standing on a hill, he's listening to some guy yell about how he's going to wipe everything out and all of that. Listen to it for a while. They had all been listening to it for 40 days and they had been coming up with why nots for 40 days. And David come in there to the camp and gave them what for? Now, is that the best thing to do? I don't know, but his success rate was 100%. <laughs> to get him healed. Yeah, one. <laughs> You still having symptoms? Uh, not really. Okay. But 
take the medication, but you're healed. And if you get a symptom, you say, that's a lie. I saw you down the valley. You're dead. You know, David considered him to be a dead man before he ever went down off that hill. He wasn't going down there to get in a fight. He was going down to kill somebody. There's a big difference. Getting in a fight, you don't know what's going to happen. You go down and kill somebody, you already know. 